Hey guys, Will here. So I'm really excited for today's video. It's not every day that you get to check out a brand's first attempt at a sim racing product, but that's exactly what we're gonna be doing today. This is the Turtle Beach Velocity One race package, which includes a 7.2 Newton meter direct drive wheelbase, a removable interchangeable steering wheel, three pedal load cell brake pedal set and integrated button box. So it certainly seems at least on paper, like a lot of value for money, but of course looks can certainly be deceiving. So what we're gonna be doing today is unpacking all of this for you guys, showing you as much detail as you possibly can so you can decide whether this might be the sim racing product for you. So let's get started. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff to get through today, as you can see, but firstly, some important information so you have the full context of exactly what we're doing today. So firstly, a big thank you to Turtle Beach for sending this gear across to us to check out. Now, I actually reached out to their Australian marketing agency that they deal with. So I haven't actually spoken with Turtle Beach directly. Most of these companies have an agency that they deal with this kind of stuff through. So I reached out to the agency and uh, organized for this to be sent across to us to check out. I'm not sure if they're gonna ask for it back or not. Now, I am hoping that we'll be able to hold on to it long-term so we can cover product evolution. There are definitely a couple of things, both on the hardware and the software side, that I think uh, certainly can be improved into the future. And software should be as simple as things like firmware updates, software updates, and whatnot. So I'm definitely keen to cover that for you guys. Now we do have some affiliate links down in the description below. We will be comparing this to a couple of other products in today's video as well. So it's important that you know that uh, all of those other products that we're comparing to were all provided to us under the same kinds of conditions as well. And we have affiliate links for pretty much everything linked down in the description below. So regardless of what you decide you wanna pick up, if anything, uh, that's an awesome way of helping support our work here at Boosted Media at no additional cost to you. That's just something that's available to you guys if you find what we do here of benefit and you wanna help support us. So we really do appreciate your support there. But as is always the case, we haven't had any words put in our mouth whatsoever. This is purely just gonna be my own observations and my own opinions, having been testing this guy out for a couple of weeks now. So let's dive in, first of all, talking about pricing. So the Turtle Beach Velocity One race package does genuinely give you everything that you need to get up and driving. It includes an integrated uh, table clamp. The pedals do actually work quite well despite being load cell pedals on a floor as well. So you don't necessarily need to have a sim rig or any sort of cockpit or wheel stand to get up and driving with this. A simple desk will do the job to get you up and driving with this thing. And I think it's important to call that out right from the start here because with a lot of sim racing gear, there are some associated hidden costs if you really wanna get into things. So you ultimately end up needing to buy a wheel stand or needing to buy a separate table clamp or you know little little bits and pieces like that that can stack up over time whereas this genuinely gives you everything you need to get up and driving so the cost for this guy is 649 us dollars or 1299 australian dollars including gst here in australia so obviously check your local taxes shipping costs import duties and whatnot i believe this will also be sold through amazon so we may see some fluctuations in pricing there and given turtle beach's presence in traditional bricks and mortar retail stores with their headsets i would imagine that we're probably going to see these available on shelves as well. And for that reason, I think that it is going to be something that probably will sell quite well, despite some of the shortcomings that we're gonna be covering in today's video, simply because at face value, it does include a lot of things. You've got the pedals, you've got the button box, you've got the integrated dash, you've got interchangeable steering wheels. You know, when you compare it to something like a G923 or some of the Thrustmaster gear that you would typically see in bricks and mortar retail, remembering that other brands like Fanatec, Sim Magic, Mozza, for example, don't tend to sell in shopfront retail. So a lot of people aren't even aware that they exist when they pick up something like this. I think that this does have a lot of, I guess you could call it shelf appeal. So yeah, it's a relatively aggressive price point. Uh, there's a couple of different comparisons here that I've made just in my notes. Nothing really that directly competes with this other than just some of the Fanatec uh, ready to race bundles. Now there's quite a few different configurations there and I would recommend, we've got a we've got a Fanatec buyer's guide that takes you through all the various different packages available and what we recommend, what, uh, where the value is in terms of the various different steering wheels the different pedal sets that you can choose and uh, different strengths in terms of the wheelbases as well. So it is a pretty comprehensive ecosystem that Fanatec have around this kind of price range that does give you an abundance of choice when it comes to exactly what you're wanting out of your racing experience. So definitely do your own research there, but if you're looking for a comparable kind of package that gives you everything you need to get up and driving with the exception of a table clamp, which is an additional cost. Uh, with a Fanatec ready to race bundle, those start at around the kind of 500 US dollar mark uh, for the eight Newton meter wheelbases, which are comparable strength to this at 7.2 Newton meters, but without a load cell brake pedal. But out of the ready to race bundles, my pick at around the same kind of Newton meter strength as what we have here with a load cell brake would be the McLaren Elite bundle, which does come with the CSL Elite V2 pedals and the boost kit. So it gives you eight Newton meters of strength out of the wheelbase. And that comes in at 799 US dollars. So it is a little bit more expensive than what we have here. As we get on through today's video, I'll explain some of the differences in the driving experience between those packages 
videos just so you get a better understanding of what might best suit you and why I feel the way I do about this particular product and what it represents in terms of value. Now, most of the other comparable sim racing hardware that's available out there does ultimately end up being quite a bit more expensive than what this is when you factor in all those additional costs. So things like having to buy pedals separately, having to buy clamps and whatnot. So a couple of examples just to give you an idea here. The Thrustmaster T818, which is a 10 newton meter direct drive wheelbase. Unfortunately, we haven't actually tested one of those. So I can't comment on how it compares in terms of the driving experience, but that is, uh, you're looking at 649 US dollars at the time that we're recording this, obviously factor in taxes, shipping costs and whatnot into your calculation there. But that's, uh, yeah, that's 649 US dollars. So same price as this guy is, but that doesn't come with a wheel or pedals. So obviously that's gonna end up ultimately being a lot more expensive. You've got the Moza R9 bundle as well, which comes with a CS wheel. We do have a review of both of those products right here on the channel if you wanna check those out. Uh, that bundle comes in at 999 US dollars uh, as listed on their website. Again, doesn't include pedals, so that will be quite a significant additional cost. And their shipping is quite expensive as well, depending on where you buy it Moza from. So definitely pays to do your research in terms of different retailers for Moza. So again, quite a bit more expensive than what you have here. You then got the Logitech G Pro, which is an 11 Newton meter wheelbase that does come with a steering wheel. There's then also the Logitech G Pro, which is an 11 Newton meter wheelbase, does come with a steering wheel, but not with pedals. You buy the pedals separately. I think you can buy them as a bundle, but just for the base and wheel alone, you're looking at around about a thousand US dollars. So again, quite a lot more expensive than what you're getting here. And the reason why I'm kind of elaborating on this is that I know for me, at least in my mind, when I saw this product, those are the kinds of products that I was comparing it to. And I kind of had to break outside of that uh, outside of that mold a little bit and really kind of focus on the overall driving experience that we're getting from this compared to something like a Logitech uh, G923, for example, which is around about half the price of this package and really kind of look at what we're actually getting here in terms of value for money. Is this actually fundamentally better than something like a G923? And is it you know, half as good as something that costs twice as much? So that's the kind of framework that I'm placing this in, in terms of a point of reference when we're talking about this. Now, of course, that's not an exhaustive list of all the various different alternatives that are available out there. That's just a couple of examples that I've picked that are things that I would personally consider if I was looking at something like this. But as I said earlier, I think regardless of the actual driving experience, this probably will be quite a popular product just from people picking it up in traditional traditional bricks and mortar retail. So it'll be really interesting to see how those people actually rate the experience, given that most of them will probably be either buying into sim racing for the very first time or upgrading from something like a Logitech G920 or G923, which this does give a superior driving experience to. So that's where it sits in the market in terms of price point. Let's dive into the hardware now and show you exactly what you're getting for your money. So let's set the pedals aside to begin with and focus in on the steering wheel base and button box. So as I mentioned in the intro, the wheel is actually removable from the wheelbase. So it does have a not standard style NRG quick release. And the reason why I say not standard is because if you do try to use a Mozza or Simagic wheel like this Simagic Neo that we have here, uh, the diameter of the quick release is actually a little bit different. So you can see here, it kind of wobbles around on there and it has a completely different configuration of these retainer ball bearings that's actually slip into place over the collar. So completely different quick release, even though it looks very similar in design, you're not gonna be able to just interchange other wheels on here. Now I'm not 100% certain on how the wheel actually connects to the base in terms of the data throughput. Uh, it does have five pins, it's five little pogo pins in the assembly here that you can see. And those are basically spring loaded little pins and those make contact with the positive and negative pads that we have here on the front of the quick release, but there's no other rings here for data transmission at all. So that leads me to believe that there must be some sort of a wireless connection between the wheel and the wheelbase. Having said that, we didn't notice any issues in terms of dropouts or lag or anything like that that would uh, you know, indicate any potential issue. So yeah, the experience there was absolutely fine. But uh, yeah, we don't, we don't know at this point, they haven't shared anything in terms of a roadmap for other accessories. It would be really cool if they released some sort of a hub adapter that allows you to just run any steering wheel that you wanted on the base. I don't know whether it's gonna be like Fanatec where they disable the force feedback if you don't have one of their wheels connected. So those are all the kinds of things that we'll explore into the future. I'm sure that at some point we'll see some aftermarket hub adapters from companies like SRM, for example, whose adapters we reviewed not long ago here on the channel and we're very impressed with. But for now, it is just the one wheel that you can use with this particular wheelbase. So let's take a look at the wheel itself in more detail. The quick release is actually absolutely fine. There's a little bit of side to side movement in it, uh, as you can see in this footage here. But look, overall, nothing really to complain about. I'm quite happy with it. It's nice and solid. One thing I did notice is that you do have to actually pull the collar 
to put the wheel onto the base, whereas a lot of other quick releases of this kind of style, uh, you can just push the wheel directly onto. You can see this this wheel, the um, the retainer actually clicks into position when the wheel is disengaged from the quick release. And then when you push the wheel onto the base, it snaps back into position. Whereas with this guy, you actually do need to pull the collar when you put the wheel onto the base, which makes it a little bit more awkward to mount, but not a problem. Uh, I would say the, the flex in the quick release itself is probably, or the, uh, it's probably not really flex, it's more play. There's a little bit of movement, little free play movement there. Um, similar to the experience that you get with the old QR1, uh, club sport quick releases, the metal quick releases from Fanatec, but way, way, way less flex than you get with the uh, simplified QR1, the plastic composite quick releases there. They had a lot more flex overall. So yeah, just one thing to be aware of there if you are comparing against the uh, Fanatec ready to race bundles, that is one area of strength of this guy over those ones if you're getting a wheel that comes with the uh, plastic simplified or plastic composite simplified quick release. So just be aware of that. Uh, flip the wheel around to the front now. What exactly do we have here? So 300 millimeter diameter diameter with a D-shaped bottom. Now it is quite an aggressive D-shape. You can see here in this footage now of me doing some drifting testing that it does tend to bounce around quite a lot in your hands. I would much prefer, given that this is the only steering wheel that they currently offer within this ecosystem, if it were a round wheel. I know a lot of people prefer this D-shaped wheel for particular types of driving. Uh, it does give you a little bit more clearance to your knees as well, which may be important for some people in some contexts. But in terms of overall versatility, a round wheel does tend to be much better in my opinion, just because it's not gonna be a problem for drifting or rally or anything else. But given 300 millimeter diameter, it is very versatile in that regard, makes it nice and easy to drive anything from your Formula One style cars all the way through to drifting and rally style cars. So as I always say in my wheel reviews, the smaller diameter, the more twitchy and uh, more reactive the wheel tends to feel, the larger the diameter, the more muted and uh, dampened the steering feels overall. So if you go up to say like a 320 millimeter wheel on something like a Logitech G923, for example, you'll notice that the steering feels a lot more vague than it does on a smaller wheel. Weight is also an important factor in that equation as well. This particular wheel by my measurement weighs in at 1.4 kilograms. So not particularly light, but certainly not the heaviest wheel that we've ever tested either. It is quite nicely balanced overall. It does sit nicely in the middle if you have it centered, it doesn't try to rotate or do anything crazy like that. Now, the reason why weight is important is because of rotating mass. So the more rotating mass you have connected to a, uh, to a wheelbase, the, again, the more dampened, the more, uh, the more impact it's gonna have on that fidelity overall. More of a, uh, more of a deal on weaker force feedback systems. At 7.2 Newton meters that we have here, it feels absolutely fine with this wheel. There's plenty of fidelity there in terms of the actual detail. We'll get into force feedback and some of the shortcomings there later on when we dive more into the driving experience overall. But uh, yeah, in terms of the sharpness and the detail that you're actually feeling, I don't feel like the wheel has a uh, large impact on that overall. So some good design choices there overall with regards to diameter and weight. I would prefer to see a round wheel just in terms of versatility, but otherwise, okay. Now, in terms of the materials used here, the first thing I noticed when I picked this wheel up was that it doesn't have any squish in the uh, in the grip areas at all. So it does, it does just feel like it's hard plastic underneath this wrapping that they put on here. Now, I don't think that it's leather or anything like that. It certainly doesn't have a leather or even like a, uh, a pleather kind of smell to it. It just feels like some sort of a uh, PVC wrapping that they put around. And I did notice, I don't know whether you'll be able to pick it up on camera, but in the very corner there where, the, uh, where it's wrapped around, there is a little bit of uh, wear on the grips. So, I mean, it's too early to say yet. We've only put maybe, you know, six or seven hours of usage into this so far. So too early to tell whether there's any wear and tear on the grips just from regular usage. But definitely let us know in the comments if you buy one of these wheels, how it stands the test of time. Maybe jump back on the uh, comments after six months or so and let us know, because that's always a better test than what we can do here in the studio anyway. But look, the, the, the material itself feels okay. I didn't have any issues with it feeling overly clammy or sweaty or anything like that, but doesn't have any squish in the grips themselves. If we quickly grab the Fanatec P1 wheel, just note that I do have the QR2 light upgrade on this. This normally would come with the QR1 simplified, which uh, is far inferior to what we have on here. Look, overall, I mean, if we put the two side by side, you can see there's a lot more going on with the Turtle Beach wheel. Uh, again, this is included in bundles that are significantly cheaper than what the Turtle Beach is, uh, but don't come with load cell pedals either. But look, in terms of the overall material quality between the two, the faceplate design and whatnot, I can see that uh, Turtle Beach have probably actually had this in their sights when they were designing this and wanted to try and come out with something that was of comparable quality, but maybe with a few more features than what we get with the Fanatec offering. So the buttons and everything actually feel 
relatively similar. I would say the Fanatec ones maybe feel a little bit better, but there's really not a whole lot in it. They are plastic touch points. One thing I did notice is that when the backlighting, as you'll see in the footage here, is enabled on the uh, on the wheel, there is a little bit of uh, bleed, I guess you could call it, on the sides of the buttons. So I think that these buttons are just painted and maybe they haven't done the best job there. Some of the buttons were worse than others, but look, they do have quite a plasticky, cheap, feeling to them, similar to what you'd find on, say, a Logitech G923, for example. So certainly not an upgrade in terms of the material quality and feel of the wheel in your hands compared to something like a G923. And those actually do have a leather wrapping on the, uh, on the wheel themselves as well. But I mean, this has got a rubberized grip material, so it feels maybe a little tiny bit more squishy in your hands, but not really a huge difference between the two. But yeah, I mean, you guys can see for yourselves there, the materials that they've used throughout the wheels are very, very similar to each other. Pretty much what you would expect for two packages that come in at a similar or at least comparable kind of price point, give or take a few features as we'll get on through today's video. But let's put that guy back aside again for now and talk a little bit more about what we have here in terms of input. So we already briefly talked about the buttons on the face here. So we also have some little toggle switches on the top on each side here as well. So they look like normal thumb encoders that you'd find on any other wheel, but you can see they're a spring-loaded mechanism that rotates in either direction. Now they are a uh, cast aluminium of some, of some variety material. So they do, they've they got a relatively okay feel to them again for the price point, but I'm not a big fan of this spring-loaded mechanism. I would much prefer to have a normal rotary encoder. You do adapt to it when you're driving. So, you know, if this is the first sim racing wheel you've ever used, you're probably not going to know the difference to be honest. But for me, having used a lot of rotary encoder style wheels, I do much prefer that approach. But look, it's got a decent action to it with or without gloves absolutely fine. You're not going to find that you're accidentally making adjustments that you don't intend to do. So that is absolutely fine. You also have a rotary encoder and a four-way hat switch down the bottom as well. So that guy doesn't have any push button functionality. And again, that is a cast aluminium dial there and then a plastic hat on the switch here. So you've got left and right on your rotary encoder and then you've got left, right, up, down, but no push button on the little hat switch there. You've then got another rotary switch and two buttons on the left-hand side. That is exclusively used for navigating through the various different menus on the wheelbase, as you'll see later on. So not something that you can map inside the game, whether or you're on uh, Xbox or PC, that is the case. So that is everything you have in terms of inputs on the front of the wheel. It actually isn't as feature rich as it perhaps looks at a glance once you break it down. But look, all the basics are definitely there. Otherwise, on the face of the wheel is plastic construction throughout here. You can see the giant Turtle Beach logo in the middle here, which seems to be a bit of a theme with these uh, with these kinds of wheels at this kind of price point. If you look at the Fanatec uh, GT DD Extreme and the GT DD Pro, they both have a similar kind of thing going on as well. I'm not a big fan of it personally, but that's just my subjective opinion. Let us know in the comments down below what you think. But they're doing quite a nice job here with the photo carbon fiber finish. So this is just an injection molded plastic that's got a texture to it, but it looks relatively, you know, genuine. It looks like carbon fiber at a glance at least. So I think they've done a relatively good job there. A nice little uh, metal inlay there with the Turtle Beach logo on it as well. I think they could have done without this button and just gone with the logo there. I think that would look a lot more classy, but again, that's just my opinion. But then if we flip the wheel around, uh, on the back here, we have our magnetic shifter paddles. Now you can see if, they, if Tom can get in there with the camera, you can see the little neodymium magnet that sits up there. Look, honestly, the magnets don't feel like they're doing anything for these shifters. If I compare that to the feeling of the shifters that we have on the P1 wheel from Fanatec, these are reverberating through the casing of the wheel a little bit more than what we have on the Turtle Beach. So when we click it, you feel a kind of vibrations through the wheel, which does give it a bit of a cheap feeling overall. But the actual action to shifting is a little bit more positive, a little bit more intentional with the P1 wheel. And there's less flex overall in these paddles, although there is still a considerable amount of flex there, as you can see. So, I mean, they're not fantastic feeling shifters, but they're adequate for the price point on this wheel. And I would say the same for this wheel, really. Relatively snappy there, but you can see if I if I get into that, there's a lot of flex there. So whether or not that is acceptable for the price point, all other things considered, considering that you're getting a dash, a button box, a load cell pedal, I'll let you guys decide for yourselves. It is what it is, but you can see there's quite a lot of flex there on both sides. Now, another thing that we did notice with this particular wheel too, and you can see it right now, that shifter is now actually stuck in. So if I pull it, it sticks there and then I tap it again and it releases. Once it gets a bit of a few cycles of usage into it, it does seem to loosen up again. You can see now it's, uh, yeah, it's sticking maybe like 30% of the time. 
but definitely a uh, definitely a quality control issue there. One thing I did notice is uh, this this box had actually been previously opened. Uh, it did still have the factory seals on it. You can see in this footage here, we did remove the factory seal from the back of the quick release. So I don't think that they'd actually driven with this before sending it to us, but it certainly wasn't completely factory sealed like what you would find at retail. So that leads me to believe that somebody probably did actually check this before they sent it to us and uh, missed the fact that, that was sticking. You can see it's come loose again now and it's fine, but yeah. So yeah, definitely not something that you want to encounter with your shifters and hopefully nobody else has that problem. But again, if you do buy one of these, let us know in the comments if you have a similar issue there. We do have a couple of analog paddles on the wheel as well, which is something we don't see on the P1 if you've got a keen eye. Uh, these aren't as functional as you get on a lot of other wheels and wheelbases, so you can't use them as a bite point clutch, for example. There's no adjustment there for the bite point. As you can see in the footage of the settings here, there are a couple of options with regards to how you can map these. But the important thing to understand here is that it doesn't actually recognize these paddles as an entirely separate axis in your sim. So if you have it in clutch mode, for example, it binds it to the same input as a clutch on your pedal. So when you push the clutch paddle on the wheel or the clutch on your pedals, it does exactly the same thing. So you're not actually able to map it as a completely separate device. So you have the option of clutch, throttle, brake, or uh, handbrake. And uh, although they don't have a handbrake accessory available yet, I would assume that if they do release one, it probably is gonna end up working the same way. So you're not gonna be able to have two separate axes for your wheel and your physical handbrake inside the sim. Now, I don't know whether that's just a limitation of the Xbox compatibility. I know there are a limited number of inputs on Xbox, but that's the way it works. So just wanna make sure that you guys are aware of that. But the analog paddles, they got an okay feeling to them, similar amount of flex as what we had on the shifters. I'd say it's probably a little bit more forgivable on the analog paddles than it is on the shifters because they're not something that you, you kind of, they're not something that you rely on for immersion as much as what you do with shifters that you're using all the time. But they've got a relatively good action, plenty of movement there. And I, I had these mapped to my handbrake for uh, when I was drifting in Assetto Corsa, for example, and when I did a bit of rally driving and it worked absolutely fine, did what it needed to do. So I don't think anybody's gonna have an issue with those for the price point. And if you've got a keen eye, you may also notice that there is an RSB and an LSB button on the back here as well, which are mappable on the PC or uh, will map as LSB and RSB if you are in Xbox mode on your Xbox. And I think that's everything to cover in terms of the wheel itself. So let's move over onto the wheelbase now. So. This is a bit of a mixed bag, and I feel like the main shortcomings with the wheelbase are actually more in the software and firmware integration than the hardware itself. The hardware itself actually seems to be of relatively good quality. You can see some, uh, some shots here of the internals as we go through it. You can see the motor inside there is like a sealed unit, and then they mount that motor inside the assembly here and give it this fancy looking casing, which makes it look a little bit, uh, a little bit more toy-like in my opinion. For me personally, I prefer to just have a motor on my rig that's small and concealable, but you know, not everybody thinks that way, and that's absolutely fine. They're obviously targeting a certain type of market with this particular product. But look, it's a direct drive base, 7.2 Newton meters of peak torque, but I would say that it feels a little bit weaker, noticeably weaker than the CSL DD does at its eight Newton meters with the boost pack. So we already talked about the quick release in a little bit of detail. This is a CNC machined aluminum uh, hub that we have here on the face of the motor. And yeah, it does what it needs to do well enough, I'd say. And I do definitely like the fact that they have chosen to give us an interchangeable wheel system here. Very excited to see what they come out with in the future in terms of other wheels that will work with this wheelbase. And hopefully they come out with some sort of a hub adapter that lets you use your own third party wheels. I think they'll be missing out on a whole segment of the market if they don't do something like that. Because there's a lot of people that just want to run a vanilla wheel from eBay or whatever for drifting and whatnot. And uh, you know probably aren't going to want to run something like this for the reasons that we discussed previously. So what else do you need to know about the wheelbase as a piece of hardware? Obviously we'll get into the actual driving experience later on today. Uh, so you've got a 30 degree angle on the wheel, which isn't adjustable. So that means that if you have the wheel sitting on a flat table, the wheel is sitting at a 30 degree tilt. That worked absolutely fine for me and was comfortable with this thing mounted on a desk. For a sim rig, if you're mounting it in that scenario, you may find that you run into some limitations depending on your particular rig with being able to tilt it far enough forward to get the angle right. Obviously there's a lot of variables there with regards to the wheel position relative to the seat and whatnot. But 30 degrees I think is a good choice. It would have maybe been nice to see the ability to adjust that somehow, but that introduces the opportunity for flex and a point of failure and whatnot. So I, I wouldn't say that it's a bad decision to have a fixed angle like what we have here. It's pretty universal among most products of this kind of design, I would say. So integrated table mount down the bottom here, you can actually see these two metal legs here, which actually wind out. So we'll show you some footage here of actually mounting it on the table. Basically these two little wings 
fold up. You've got two large bolts which allow you to wind in and wind out those uh, those legs, and then it actually comes inside the little pouch here with a little Allen key tool with uh, the appropriate Allen key for making adjustments there. And a second one here as well, which I haven't actually found a use for so far, but uh, I'm sure somebody in the comments will let me know exactly what that one's for. So that sits in the little pouch here so you don't lose it. It does tend to rattle around quite nastily though. So I would recommend maybe tucking that away somewhere else and hiding it out of place. But as you can see here in the footage, mounting this on the table, relatively easy to do. They just wind out. It's a little bit cumbersome to kind of get in there and twist. A little bit more clumsy, I would say, than the mounting system you have with say a Logitech G923 or whatever, but does have the advantage of being able to clamp in much harder with the Allen key as opposed to plastic legs. And it is a fully metal design there as well. So we didn't have any issues with the thing bouncing around or moving or sliding or anything like that on our particular setup with the 7.2 newton meters of strength that we have here. So I would say in conclusion there, the uh, the mounting system works absolutely fine. If you have a keen eye, you may have also noticed the uh, standard mounting pattern that we have on the bottom down here as well. I believe that that is the same as what you would find on the older belt driven uh, thrust master wheelbases, if I'm not mistaken. It's been a long time since I've looked at one of them to be honest with you. But either way, uh, all the rigs that we had here that had mounting patterns for Logitech and, uh, and Thrustmaster also were compatible with this. So we didn't have to drill any holes, which is a sensible choice. We've seen a couple of new brands come into the, uh, the sim racing space and uh, come out with their own mounting pattern, which is different from every other brand. And of course, then it takes a while for the uh, cockpit and wheel stand manufacturers to catch up with that and start offering those uh, those hole patterns. So I think it's sensible to copy somebody else's design in that regard. I wish there was actually like a standardized system for hole patterns that everybody conformed to. So we didn't have to have these wheel plates that have a million holes in them. It would just make everything a lot easier. I'm sure everybody would agree. So whether you're hard mounting or table mounting this thing, absolutely no issues with flex that we ran into whatsoever at the 7.2 newton meters of strength that this guy offers. Now in terms of inputs and outputs, we have our standard Xbox buttons on the face of the wheelbase here, exactly the same as what you would find on your Xbox controller. And then on the side, we've got a power button and a K drive button, which allows us to make some adjustments to the force feedback, which we'll get into a little bit later. You'll also notice on the side here, a USB port for connecting our button box, which we are gonna talk about in a lot of detail in just a moment. There's also a headphone and uh, microphone jack here as well. So it's a standard 3.5 mil uh, stereo plus microphone jack. And the software itself, which is built into the base, does have a couple of cool options as you can see here for making adjustments to your balance, your uh, EQ even. And I did actually find that to be quite useful. It's quite convenient to be able to go into the menu system, make those kinds of adjustments on the fly. And uh, not something that we've ever seen on any other sim racing uh, hardware that I can think of in the past before. So I thought that was quite a nice little inclusion there. If we spin the base around as well quickly too, just to give you a look at what we have on the back here, we've got our standard power jack, we've got our USB-C input, and then two USB-C connections for peripherals. So our pedals actually do connect via this nice braided cable directly to one of those, either one of those is fine. Uh, obviously when they release further accessories into the future, assuming that they will, those will connect through that interface as well. Now it doesn't operate as a standard USB-C interface, so you can't just connect a webcam or some other brand directly to the base, unfortunately, but it is nice to see a USB-C connection there. And one thing I did appreciate is the fact that the connections themselves are slightly recessed into the base as well. So the plug that you have on here sits nicely in there and uh, you know, it protects it a little bit so that it comes out straight. If you step on the cable, it's gonna kind of pull it out straight rather than, uh, rather than damaging that connector. So a nice little touch there. In terms of the power supply, a nice small little package here, a relatively short cable on the, uh, on the power supply itself. Uh, I measured it at about a meter and a half on this particular example. And uh, it was just that tiny little bit too short on our particular sim rig to sit comfortably on the ground with cable management. So I would like them to, uh, to increase the length of that cable to maybe two, two and a half meters. That was one small little nitpick. But look, in terms of the power supply, it is a uh, 24 volt DC five amp or 120 watt output on this. And it is just a standard DC uh, jack style connector with a little pin internally and then the sleeve around the outside. So nothing particularly special there. It is a completely passive device. There's no cooling fans or anything like that inside the power supply. Uh, and that is everything I think you need to see in terms of the base itself. So let's move on now. Let's talk about this button box. This is where I was quite, uh, quite disappointed for reasons that will become obvious very quickly. So the first issue that I have with this button box is uh, the amount of flex that it has. Look, when you're pressing the buttons, the thing just does have 
an awful lot of flex, which just kind of ruins the immersion. I mean, one of the, one of the things that you want with a button box is to, you know, it, you want it to pull you into the experience of driving a race car. You want it to feel like you're in a race car. And when you've got a flimsy thing that's just rocking around like this, it just, it just completely ruins that experience uh, entirely, in my opinion, at least anyway. So whether it's uh, one of the buttons that you're pressing or a rotary encoder, or even this uh, pretty funky missile switch that we have here, which also does have a little illumination in the front as well. It just isn't a great experience. And like, I mean, I just, I, again, I have to put it in the context of, you know, all the things that you're getting for the price point, but it's not a cheap piece of hardware at the end of the day. And that does stand out to me as something that's, uh, just doesn't give you the same level of experience that you have elsewhere on the hardware. So definitely something that I think they should improve upon or uh, maybe revise for another version later on. Now, the other issue that I have with the button box as well is the, uh, is the actual integration when it comes to the buttons. Now, there's two issues that I have with this in terms of functionality. One of those is very, very major. And that is the fact that these two buttons up here, the start and stop buttons, are actually uh, to turn on and turn off the wheelbase. So you would think, that you would be able to map the engine start and engine stop button to those functions inside your sim, at least for PC users, that was that's generally what you would expect on any other button box, right? Just kind of makes sense that way. But no, this turns on the wheelbase, that's okay, but if you accidentally touch that button, even just momentarily, it actually switches off the wheelbase entirely. And there were multiple instances where I was trying to uh, make adjustments to this particular rotary encoder here and accidentally bumped that guy with uh, with gloves on and switched off the wheelbase. And, uh, you know, depending on the sim racing title that you're driving, you may actually have to completely quit out of the game for it to reconnect again afterwards. So that is, to me, one of the signs that this is a company that's new to sim racing. And look, honestly, I'm just surprised that this made it through to production at all. I'm sure that if they'd consulted with the majority of sim racers prior to production on this, most of you guys probably would highlight that as an issue and something that should change before we reach production. So that is definitely one thing that uh, was a big, uh, a big turn off for this particular button box. But also just in terms of mapping, again, it kind of makes more sense on Xbox than it does on PC. You can see here for each of the buttons, you can assign it to a specific function either on the wheelbase itself, so adjusting settings pertaining to the uh, to the software on the wheelbase or the firmware on the wheelbase, or you can map those to functions on the Xbox controller. In the context of a PC, you are very limited in what you can do here. So you can't just map every single button to whatever button press you want inside the game, like what you would with a conventional button box. Uh, you are limited to the functions that they actually stipulate that you can assign them to. So a little bit of a frustration there. We were able to assign a couple of the encoders to just whatever button we wanted. The last complaint that I have about this button box is these toggle switches that we have down the bottom here are actually double throw switches. So they have a middle position, a lower position, and an upper position. But in every instance that I could find at least, only the upper position is actually mappable to any function, whether it be through the functions built into the wheelbase, the Xbox controller as we were describing earlier, or in your sim racing title. The downward movement doesn't appear to actually have any function at all. So I have no idea why they've done that. Maybe it's something, some sort of functionality that they're gonna add later on. Maybe I'm missing something, but I, I spent quite a bit of time trying to figure that out and uh, wasn't able to, to do so. But there are obviously single throw toggle switches available on the market. So I just don't see the reason why they went with a double throw switch for something that only has a single throw function. But that is the button box, very underwhelming overall. You can see how thin that little mounting bracket is there and it just has an unacceptable, even for the price point, I would say, an unacceptable amount of flex. And it's just a very, very, very underwhelming experience overall. So lastly, with regards to the wheelbase, we need to talk about the integrated five inch by my measurement display. Now they don't give us the resolution or the actual dimensions of the screen at all in the literature, but I measured it to be uh, five inches. But look, it is a nice vibrant display here. Uh, and look, it's responsible for a couple of different things. I think the, the thing that you need to be aware of here is that it's kind of similar to what we see with Fanatec's tuning menu system. So it's capable of displaying telemetry out of the game as well as giving you the ability to make adjustments to the settings as you guys have seen as we've been progressing through today's video in a little bit of detail already. So when you push these buttons down on the wheel down here, so you've got the scroll wheel 
That basically brings up the menu that you see here. And then you've got a back button and a select button here, which allows you to make those selections as you're going through. So you basically got a bunch of different icons here that allow you to make adjustments to each particular setting. Now we could go through every single setting here and explain exactly what everything does. But thankfully Turtle Beach has actually got a really good document on their support website. It was a little bit difficult to find, but I've linked it down in the description below for you guys. So if you are genuinely looking at buying one of these wheels, uh, I would recommend click on that link down in the description below have a look at that. It's going to take you through every single setting and adjustment that you have available on this base, at least at the time that we're uh, making this video. And I'm hoping that they'll keep that document updated if they do make any firmware adjustments as well. So with that in mind, what I want to do is kind of just talk you through the experience of using this overall, because I think that's probably where the value is in the, uh, in the context of a video like this. So using the little scroll wheel here, we navigate through the various different menu items, and then basically we select each one to drill in and uh, make adjustments to those particular settings. One of the things that I really like about it is that you do have multiple profiles that you can set. So just like what we have within the Fanatec ecosystem, which has always been a really strong selling point for them, you can set up different profiles to different cars or even different sims, and then quickly change between them using the wheel without having to alt tab and go across into software. Now I should also mention that there is a uh, pretty complete software package available for PC, which allows you to make all the same adjustments that you see on here as well. Doesn't really give you access to any settings in and above what you can do through the wheelbase, which I actually think is a good thing. And look, overall, I actually think it is a cleaner implementation overall than what we have with Fanatec's ecosystem, just simply because you've got one software package that deals with everything, whereas with Fanatec, you've got their uh, you've got their driver software, and then you have Fanalab, which sits on top of that as another layer. There's a little bit more functionality, actually quite a lot more functionality in the Fanatec ecosystem, as you'll see a little bit later on when we talk about driving. But in terms of just accessibility and ease of use, this is a lot more similar to what you see with the G923 and the G Pro from Logitech, if you're familiar with those. And again, you can check out our reviews of both of those products if you want to learn more about those. But very approachable, very simple to use, not overwhelming in any regard. And I would say it's a very similar experience, both using the integrated dash as well as the software. There is also a smartphone app available as well, which allows you, in theory, to make the same kinds of adjustments that you can from the wheelbase too. But uh, we weren't actually able to get that working. We were able to get it to connect to the wheelbase, but it just didn't seem to really have any functionality at all other than just switching between profiles, which we couldn't get to work anyway. So not sure exactly what the deal is with that, but you don't really need it anyway because you can do everything from the wheel, which I think is really nice. So while overall, I would say that it is a nice clean integration, it is a little bit clumsy sometimes. There's a couple of little quirks, just things like adjusting the wheel sensitivity, for example. So if you want to adjust the sensitivity, you've got to scroll this little wheel here and it doesn't sense whether you're uh, trying to go a long way or a little way. So it goes in 10 degree increments from uh, whatever the minimum value you want. So say 320 degrees, for example, all the way up to 2,600 degrees for truck sims. But if you wanna change that, you've gotta go round, 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 round for like a minute and a half to get all the way up there. Now, of course, because we have those profiles, you could just set up a truck sim profile and switch to that profile. So not a major issue, but just little, I guess, uh, UI tweaks that they could make to improve the experience overall. But I do love the fact that everything is so nicely integrated here. Now they do also, as part of the package as well, of course, have telemetry built into a couple of different dashes, uh, which you can see here on the display as well. So there's three separate dashes that you have by default. They may expand upon that into the future. There's a secondary software package which you can install, which uh, pulls the telemetry data in from the SIM title that you're running, or you can also pull that data in through SIM Hub as well. But it's important to understand that while it does integrate with SIM Hub in terms of pulling telemetry in for the integrated dashes, you can't customize the dashes through SIM Hub like you can with many third party dashes or even a smartphone or tablet. So look, I think in terms of the display, display itself. It's a bit of a jack of all trades and master of none. Personally, in terms of the core functionality that we have here and the ability to make adjustments, I don't find it any cleaner or any easier to use than the Fanatec tuning menu is, despite obviously being a much bigger display. I think the Fanatec tuning menu and the way they've been able to make that work on such a tiny little one inch display, or even a uh, three by seven segment display as what we have on their cheaper wheels, is actually pretty, pretty darn genius. I mean, it's been around for a very long time now and I haven't seen anything that really is better than it. And I was hoping that maybe this might be a, wow, this is incredible, but in practice, it kind of just does the same thing, but you don't actually have as many adjustments to the force feedback that you can do through the software, whether it's through the wheel or through the PC software or the smartphone, as you do on pretty much any other direct drive wheelbase with the exception of Logitech maybe. So uh, we'll talk about that again when we get into the driving experience in just a minute. So. 
Yeah, look, I mean, when you consider the fact that you can't really do anything in terms of settings other than just the audio thing that we talked about earlier on this than what you can do with a Fanatec smaller display and the fact that you are a lot more limited with the dashboard functionality that you have here compared to something like a smartphone or tablet or, you know, a dedicated display device. Look, for me, yeah, a bit of a jack of all trades, master of none, I would say with regards to that. Personally, I would prefer to have a dedicated display on my wheel like what we have with Fanatec that's just for displaying basic telemetry and then have a separate dashboard, whether it be like a, an old smartphone that you have laying around or a tablet or something like that, that you can use to run with SimHub. And that way you can customize it, make it look however you want, and uh, you just get a lot more versatility and functionality overall that way. Now, of course, with Xbox, that's not always an option. So this does work quite well in that context. And look, ultimately, it's, it is a very subjective thing. I don't want to keep on repeating that over and over, but look, it, it does what it does relatively well. I just don't think that it's quite the selling point for this particular ecosystem over others that I'd perhaps hoped that it might be. I think that's probably the best way that I can describe that. So that is a quick rundown on the dash. Again, do reference that document that takes you through all the settings and adjustments that you can make there if you're wanting to get more information on that. And I would definitely recommend if you are genuinely looking at purchasing one of those, have a read of that so you have a better understanding of exactly what you can and can't do with this particular wheelbase. So what I wanna do now is move across to the pedals and then we'll get into the driving experience overall and talk a little bit more about the adjustments that we have available with the force feedback on this guy as well because that is another area of uh, significant improvement let's just say. So we'll set these guys aside and let's take a look at the pedals. So let's talk about these pedals now. And these are honestly a mixed bag. There's some things that I really like about what they've done here. And there's some things that I definitely think can be significantly improved even at this kind of price point. So let's go through this methodically now with a focus on the experience of actually using the pedals. So you've got a plastic for the most part base plate here, which does actually work quite well on carpet or mounted to a rig. So we've got a uh, hole pattern on the bottom here, which I'm not 100% sure whether it's a standard hole pattern or not, but uh, we're able to mount it relatively easily on a next level racing rig with two separate uh, panels, which we could slide into the position that we needed. Uh, but if you're wanting to mount this onto aluminum profile, which I would imagine most people that are looking at this kind of class of product probably aren't gonna be doing, but you don't have any ability to get to these holes from the top, which means you can't bolt them into T-nuts on an aluminum profile rig. You can only bolt them in from the bottom. So just be aware of that. Now you can see on the bottom here, we've got these studded rubber feet, similar to those uh, massage shoes that you can buy. Uh, those are a optional thing which is included in the package which we stuck on here when we were testing on carpet. Did do a good job of keeping these fixed in place on carpet. Being a load cell brake with a rating of 50 kilograms, you will need to have a way to stop your office chair from rolling back and forth if it's on caster wheels, so just be aware of that. If you're on a tiled floor, they do also include some flat rubber pads that you can stick on there as well. So good that they've thought about those various different scenarios and they've included inside the packet uh, some options to get you up and running regardless of the scenario. And I'd say that's definitely one of the strengths that we found overall with this package is that you know it does genuinely include everything that you need, as we said in the intro, to get up and driving. There's no traps that you're gonna find along the way with little things that you need to buy to make things work, which is great. Now, if you notice underneath here, there are a couple of channels. That actually allows us to adjust the position of the brake pedal. So if we spin it around here, you can move the brake pedal left or right within the range of adjustment that we have here. So if you prefer to have a bit more spacing between your throttle and your brake pedal, you can do that. If you wanna run as a two pedal configuration, you can do that as well. You can't actually put the brake across into this position, but you can fold the clutch pedal flat and then move this guy across to the leftmost position. And that's gonna give you a good amount of spacing between your throttle and your brake pedal. So as I said, a plastic shell for the pedals. We'll get into the implications of that in just a second. We do have this uh, kind of patterned metal heel rest here, which feels absolutely fine with uh, with socks. I don't recommend you use sim pedals with with bare feet. I know a lot of people do, but you do tend to, I mean, it gets pretty gross, but you get, you know, dead skin cells and whatnot falling in. And yeah, it's, it's just not a great thing. And then you've got to clean it. So I would recommend at least using socks, but this feels quite nice under feet, doesn't have any sharp edges or anything like that. And does feel quite solid as well. So you're not going to feel your feet kind of bouncing around on the plastic surface. So that is a relatively good little design feature there. The plastic overall does have a lot of flex in it. Now I'd be lying to you if I said that it was something that I noticed when I was driving. Given that this is a 50 kilogram uh, rated brake pedal, 
you're not putting a ton of effort into it in the first place. So when I watched the footage back, I was actually shocked at how much this whole thing, you guys can see it for yourselves, you don't need me to explain it, but you can see how much this is dipping in the middle here as we push down on the brake pedal. Even a small amount of force, you can see in this footage here, uh, Tom's actually pushing the brake pedal just with his finger and the whole thing is bending. So again, it's not something that I noticed when I was driving simply because it is a relatively soft pedal in the first place. If it was something that I was putting explosive force into and really kind of pushing in and really modulating my braking inputs right around that you know that maximum amount of force then yeah you would absolutely notice that flex as you pushed into the pedal because it would be contributing to the overall movement in the pedal but at the levels that we're using here in terms of force just not something that I really found was a factor overall. Where I would question it though, would be in the longevity of the pedals. I am concerned that with that amount of flex over time, the plastic is gonna wear out and ultimately split, but obviously we'll just have to see how it stacks up over time. So again, if you do buy one of these, let us know in the comments if you do have any problems over time. It's always valuable for people to be able to see that if they're looking at buying a product. Obviously, if we do run into any issues, we'll let you know in a pinned comment as well. But you guys collectively are in a much better position to comment on things like that than we are. It's definitely an area of concern. So no, while we're on the subject of flex, there is a lot of side to side movement in the pedals as well, as you can see here, quite a lot. It's not completely free play, like it's not just slopping around or anything like that, but there is a lot of movement there and definitely something that you notice. And uh, it is a little bit more than what you get with the CSL pedals from Fanatec, although they don't come with the load cell by default. That is an optional upgrade that you will have to pay for. So when you put it in the context, if you're comparing it to the offerings from Thrustmaster, I'm not a big fan of their TLCM load cell pedals, which I'd say are probably the most comparable to something like this. There's a lot of things about those pedals that just didn't really gel with me, but I'd say in terms of build quality, this is quite similar if you compare the two side by side. And again, we do have a couple of videos where we've covered those in detail in the past. So just while we're talking about materials and flex and whatnot, as I mentioned, plastic, uh, plastic housing here, metal heel plate. We then do have a uh, pressed steel, I believe it is, cage for each one of the three pedals. The pivot points on either side are also cast aluminium as well. So it's not a plastic assembly or stack, that is all metal. The pedal arms and foot pads are metal as well. We do have these plastic inserts behind it. If we quickly spin the pedals around again, you can see there is a little bit of adjustment in terms of the pedal pads. You can move them up or down one spot or left or right one spot as well if you wish to do so. So that is a good thing to see. In terms of other adjustments here, this was one area that I did feel these pedals were lacking compared to other options, including those TLCM pedals that we referenced just before. In the case of the TLCM pedals, there are a couple of different spring configurations and elastomers that you can swap in or swap out to adapt the feeling of the pedal. With this, literally the only adjustment that you have for the brake pedal is purely just in software. Now in the software, as you can see here, there's an adjustment for the dead zone as well as the sensitivity. And it's a simple adjustment between a low, medium or high setting. And what I found is that the low and the medium settings were just absolutely ridiculous. They literally, and I'm not exaggerating here, they literally made the pedal feel like an on-off switch, which is just ridiculous. With the high setting, I was actually overall quite impressed with how the brake operated. Now, remembering again that they are backed into a wall a little bit here because they want to try and make this something that you can use either on carpet or on a, on a tiled floor or on a sim rig. Now, given a 50 kilogram load rating here for this pedal, I was actually surprised at how well these worked on carpet, particularly with those studded pads that we showed you just earlier. I didn't find that uh, the pedals were trying to slide across the ground or anything like that. Now, obviously your experience may vary there depending on the type of surface that you're using it on, but this is the only load cell pedal set that I've ever used that I didn't have problems with having to physically mount it to my chair or find some way that to stop it sliding across the floor. A lot of people just put it hard up against the wall so it can't push up. But even just things like pushing down on the pedal wasn't so stiff that I found that it was trying to kick up underneath my feet either. Uh, and yeah, overall it was it was a really good experience in a uh, in a desk kind of environment. I'm a very heavy footed breaker. I generally break with around sort of 70 to 80 kilograms of force. That obviously comes from using very, very high end sim racing equipment, which is what I'm used to using. So putting this in the appropriate context and also considering the fact that I personally see a lot of comments from people complaining that their uh, CSL load cell kit 
from Fanatec, for example, is way too stiff for them having come from something like a Logitech G923, for example. I think that the majority of people will actually be quite happy with this brake pedal overall. I think that it's a good solid upgrade from something like a G923, for example. You just need to make sure that you have that sensitivity setting set to 100% because if you don't, if you have it set to 25 or 50%, the brake is absolutely atrocious and probably the worst brake pedal I've ever used in my life. So yeah, definitely something they need to tweak. Uh, in the Fanatec ecosystem, again, to make the comparison there, you actually have a braking force adjustment which can go from zero to 100, and that does allow you to dial it into your particular scenario really nicely. I just don't see the reason why they don't give you the same kind of adjustment here. It makes no sense to me to have three limitations there when you could just go zero to 100 and have the ability to dial it in however you want. So yeah, what I would say with regards to the feel of the brake overall, you know, if you're comparing it to something like Husingvelt Sprints or Ultimates or VRS pedals, something like that, yeah, it's gonna be underwhelming to you. If you're comparing it to something like TLCM pedals or G923 pedals or CSL pedals from Fanatec, it's comparable probably on the better side for, you know, driving on carpet, something like that. But what I would say is that I was able to, I was able to modulate my braking inputs absolutely fine with that setting set up correctly. Uh, there is a clearly defined threshold point, which if you've watched any of my dedicated pedal reviews, you would know. To me, at least, that is the most important thing. You wanna have a clearly defined threshold that you can consistently push to. That creates your threshold for braking, and then you can modulate around that trail brake off and whatnot. And I feel like these pedals do actually provide that, which did genuinely surprise me. I expected being a, you know, being a first attempt at a sim racing pedals. I think pedals are actually the hardest thing to get right on a sim rig for people that haven't done it before. And you know, when I compare this to the offerings from, say, Camus, and even some of the more expensive offerings from Mozza, for example. I actually think that these stack up pretty well for the price point. So that is the brake pedal. But look, in terms of the throttle and the clutch pedal, look, I mean, they're relatively underwhelming. There's nothing particularly outstanding or bad about them. Uh, I would say that the throttle pedal has a touch too much, uh, too much throw for me. I prefer a slightly shorter throw. I was having to extend my ankle more than uh, I would ideally like to. The more throw you have, obviously, the more control you have. So it's a very subjective thing. But for me, it would be nice to at least have some adjustment there so we could shorten the throw if we wanted to. The clutch was absolutely fine. There's no sort of two-stage effect there at all. So you don't get that simulated bite point like you get with some more expensive pedals. But again, for the price point, I don't really see that as a point of complaint. I did notice that there was a bit of a crunchy feeling in the clutch pedal. Now, the design between the two of them looks the same externally, but the clutch to me actually feels like almost like it's got some sort of a damping system integrated with it. It just, it feels like there's a little bit more resistance behind it. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but yeah, the throttle pedal basically just feels like a pedal connected to a spring. I mean, if you try a throttle pedal in a real car, you know, there's usually not really anything that is particularly remarkable about that either. So yeah, it is what it is. There's no major selling points or detractors from either of these two pedals, I would say. We do also have some preload adjustment here for the springs as well. So if you want to stiffen the pedals up a little bit, you can do that. Look, under feet, I didn't really feel like those adjustments made a significant difference to the driving experience overall anyway. One thing I do like about the pedals, which I think is worth pointing out, is they do have little rubber bump stops uh, in either direction. So that means that they are nice and quiet. As you can hear with the throttle, when we hit that maximum threshold, nice and quiet, and on the return, very quiet as well. And the same goes for all three, just with the exception of that slight crunchiness that we have in our particular clutch pedal. And again, let us know if you buy one of these, if you have the same experience with the clutch, because I'm not 100% certain whether it's just our sample or whether they're all gonna be like that. But that was one thing that I did notice. So look, overall, I think for a first attempt at a set of sim racing pedals, Honestly, they've done a pretty good job. Again, considering the context in which they're expecting people at this kind of price point to use the product, I think it does okay. The other, other thing to mention here is uh, just there is a little button on the back here for uh, switching between direct PC connections. So if you wanna connect the pedals directly to your PC via USB versus a pass-through mode for connecting via the PC. So a little bit inconvenient to, uh, to get to, but not really a big deal. And it has that same USB-C connection that we saw before uh, with the nice recessed connection. So that if you do step on the cable, it's much less likely to damage the connector itself. One question I did see a few people ask is, can you separate the pedals from the base and hard mount them to a rig? 
You could do so with a little bit of fabrication. You can see that these cages are just kind of bolted into the plastic assembly, but similar to Logitech's cheaper pedals, so not the G Pro pedals, uh, they're not really intended to do so. So you're gonna have some sort of fabrication work that you're gonna need to do. The uh, electronics are integrated into this plastic housing as well, but I'm sure you could remove that from the housing and put it in a little jiffy box or something like that if you wanted to get creative. So no, the pedals aren't intended to be uh, removed from the shell and hard mounted, but you probably could do so if you really, really wanted to. So that is the pedals. Let's now talk about the, uh, the overall experience of using everything together and what it's like to drive with. Now we haven't really touched on the force feedback much yet and there is a very good reason for that because I wanted to focus on the hardware side of things first, functionality and whatnot, and then really kind of drill into the driving experience in more detail. Now, unfortunately, the force feedback experience as it stands right now at initial release of this product is relatively underwhelming. Now, you are getting that direct drive experience in terms of fidelity, uh, detail in force feedback and whatnot. So look, here's the deal as far as I'm concerned. If you're coming from a entry level piece of sim racing equipment and looking to upgrade to something like this, you're probably gonna be happy with it. You're probably gonna be impressed with it and you're probably gonna wonder what the hell I'm talking about here in terms of nitpicking the force feedback uh, inadequacies. I'm coming from a place where I've got experience with much more high end equipment, much more expensive equipment. And you know, I know what really high quality force feedback should feel like. And I guess I'm in a somewhat unique position where I have a good understanding of as you step down through various different price points, what some of those sacrifices are that you're making in terms of what you're actually feeling through the steering. So straight up, we need to acknowledge that, you know, even strength aside here, if you're comparing the 7.2 Newton meters that we have here to uh, what you get from the eight Newton meters from a uh, CSL DD with a boost kit, or even a Mozza R9 at nine Newton meters or a Simmagic M10, the force feedback detail that you're getting with this particular wheelbase, unfortunately at the time that we're filming this, just isn't as good. On the flip side to that, if you're comparing it to a belt driven, like some of the more entry level Thrustmaster stuff, or say a Logitech G923, for example, given this is a lot more expensive, you are getting a much better experience overall. So that sounds pretty subjective. Objectively, what do I actually mean by that? What's actually going on with the force feedback here? Now I touched earlier when we were talking about the dash and menu options, that there isn't a lot of adjustability in terms of the, uh, the force feedback on this. So in a more practical and objective sense, what does that actually mean? So at the point that we're making this video, there's actually only three settings that you have for adjusting the force feedback. You've got the overall strength, maybe if you've got small kids that are using the rig and you just don't want them to have that strength where they can potentially injure themselves, that might be a consideration. But you know, the rest of the time, there's no reason to scale back that dynamic range. What you would want to do is limit the output of the game so that you're not clipping, but then still take full advantage of that full dynamic range that's available on the base. So you have that. You've then got a K drive adjustment, which is a kinetic drive adjustment. That allows you to adjust the responsiveness of the wheel overall, how quickly it reacts to what's going on in the sim. So if you're finding that um, the wheel feels a little bit sluggish underneath you, you can crank that setting up or uh, crank it down if you're finding that it's just a little bit too snappy and too reactive. Now I will say that for things like drifting, the wheel actually did feel pretty good. The, uh, the ergonomics of the wheel aside being a D-shape, which isn't really ideal for that kind of thing, but it was relatively intuitive to drive. I'm not the world's best drifter, but you can see in the footage here, I didn't have any problems other than the wheel just bouncing around in my hands because of the shape to uh, you know control the slip angle or anything like that. I did find that it was maybe a little bit robotic and a little bit notchy. You might be able to see in the footage here for yourselves, uh, but I could, I could certainly perceive that it was kind of jarring into each position that I wanted it to be rather than being just like a smooth transition. But I was able to adapt to that and uh, you know, it didn't feel sluggish or like it was lagging behind or anything like that, which is often the case with belt driven wheels or some more entry level uh, direct drive wheels that we've tested in the past. So in that regard, it was pretty good. That's what the K-Drive adjustment is aiming to do. I didn't find that the actual adjustment made a huge difference. Now, there's also a damping adjustment as well, which allows you to filter out some of that robotic feel or some of the oscillation that you may experience. Now, I didn't actually experience any oscillation with this particular wheelbase. That's been a problem uh, specifically with uh, Mozzle wheelbases over the years, uh, something that they've never really been able to dial out fully. So what that means is if you're going down a straight and you let go of the wheel, the wheel starts to shudder and shake from side to side. And sometimes you actually feel that sensation even if you're 
holding onto the wheel as well. So look, in that regard, they've done a relatively good job. But when you compare this to the likes of say the Fanatec CSL DD, the Simmagic M10, the Mozza R9, R12, and uh, upwards from there. Uh, maybe with the exception of the Logitech G Pro because that doesn't have a lot of adjustability. And you know, that can be a good or a bad thing because it does make the product a little bit more accessible as we were talking about earlier. But there is a distinct lack of adjustment in the force feedback with this particular product. And I do feel like it does hold the overall driving experience back with this particular product. I feel like if they had some more filters there, although it might make it seem overwhelming for new people into sim racing for the first time, if they included some cooked in profiles of different styles of driving, which they kind of aim to, as you can see in the overlay here, you know, they do have modes for different driving styles, but all it's really doing is just adjusting that responsiveness. It's not adjusting other filters or really doing much else. So what that results in is two things. Firstly, you're not able to adjust and tweak this thing to suit your own personal preference like you can with a lot of those other options, particularly the CSL DD at around this kind of price point, which I do think is a big advantage. You'll see for yourselves if you jump on Reddit or whatever, you know, the, the variation that you get from different people and what they like, what they dislike is, is often cases massive. And you know, that kind of goes to demonstrate how important it is to actually be able to fine tune settings to your own personal preference, which is something that you just really can't do with this particular base. Now, in an objective sense, how that actually translates through to the driving experience is there's a overall sensation of disconnect between the wheel and the car when you're driving with this. Now, that's not in the sense that there's a lack of detail. The sharpness and the responsiveness of this wheel is actually very good. So when you're going up over curbs or feeling textures inside the road or bumping into other cars even, there is a good amount of sharpness and detail there. You can definitely feel that sensation, that immersion of running up over a curb and feeling that vibration through the wheel, for example. What I found, and this is just my subjective opinion of using this wheel, but what I found compared to even cheaper options like say the, uh, the Camus C5 and Camus C12 that were reviewed recently, this particular wheelbase just doesn't give you the sensation of weight or movement or balance of the car like some of those other wheelbases do. So while you get that detail, you don't feel the sensation of weight in the steering. You don't feel the sensation of the suspension, the body roll of the car, all of those things which are fundamentally important in the absence of actually sitting inside a car and experiencing those G-forces of yourselves. The only things that we have in a sim rig to translate that are the feeling through the steering and what we actually see with our eyes or if you've got a motion rig you can use that as well or something like a butt kicker. But we rely so heavily on the sensation of all those effects through the steering on a sim rig, much more so than what we do in a real life car. In, in real life the sensation that we get through the actual steering wheel uh, isn't anywhere near as responsible for communicating what the car's doing as what we have in a wheelbase in lieu of all those other effects that we would feel through the seat of our pants. So in that sense, the overall driving experience with this wheelbase at this point in time is probably much more similar to something like a belt-driven or cog-driven wheelbase than a lot of the other direct drive wheelbases that are on the market. Now that may sound really harsh, and maybe it is a little bit harsh because that detail is there as we discussed. But the reality is at this point in time at least, there are some really fantastic direct drive wheelbases out there. Pretty much everything that we've tested from every other manufacturer has given us more of a sensation of what the car's doing underneath us than what this particular product does. And look, to me, Unfortunately, that is the most disappointing thing about this product. I feel like it is something that they fundamentally will be able to fix over time. And again, we don't, we want, we don't want to make this an excuse for them, but it is their first time releasing a sim racing product. It is a very, very difficult thing to get right. The hardware is the easy part. The software and how it actually integrates with the game and translates those effects across through the steering wheel is the hardest part to get right. And we've seen other companies struggle with this a lot. I think back to when the DD1 and DD2 were first released from Fanatec. And it took them well over a year, I would say in fairness, to actually get that to the point where to me at least it even felt as good as the Club Sport Wheelbase 2.5 had previously. Again, detail aside, what I'm talking about here is the actual sensation of you know the balance of the car underneath you. And I think those early adopters of the DD1 and the DD2 would probably know what I was talking about there. It has a slightly robotic underlying feel. The SimMagic M10, which is now a discontinued product, also comes to mind. A lot of shortcomings in terms of the actual force feedback quality, although the steering wheel itself felt quite smooth compared to a belt-driven or cog-driven wheelbase. So of course, we do have the advantages of a completely silent operation here compared to something like a belt-driven or cog-driven wheelbase. That may be a really strong selling point for some people. We have an overall very smooth experience with the steering as well. There's no torque ripple or 
or cogging or sensation of the, uh, of the mechanism switching between magnets inside the motor or anything like that. So the steering does feel very fluid and very smooth in your hands. And look, overall, I think that the, I, I think, and I want to say think because I don't know whether it's a limitation of the motor that they're using, but my, my gut feeling is that they're going to be able to improve the software here and uh, the experience is going to get a lot better over time. It's just not quite there yet. And I think that to summarize, if this was releasing three years ago, the CSL DD didn't exist yet. And you know, this was hitting that sweet spot between something like a belt driven club sport wheelbase 2.5 and something like a DD1 or DD2 or a Simicube or something like that. I would say, yeah, absolutely for the price, this thing does a really good job and it's well worth the upgrade over something like a G923 or a belt driven. That's not where we are at this point in time when we're recording this video. We've got an abundance of choice when it comes to you know, more, more low power direct drive wheelbases. We've got the Camus C5, the Camus C12, which are both very competitively priced. And although we don't rate their pedals at this point in time, the experience of actually using the wheelbases is surprisingly good, although there are a couple of shortcomings there. I think really this, the standout, if we're comparing to other products around this kind of price point, is probably the CSL DD with those ready to race bundles. Now, Fanatec, of course, do have a lot of issues at the moment with regards to customer service and delays in shipping. So that is something that you definitely want to be aware of here. I don't know what the experience is like for a customer with Turtle Beach. I've never actually bought a product from them in my life. So I can't comment on that. You guys can let us know in the comments down below. But if you are looking at Fanatec as an alternative to this, you definitely do need to be aware of some of the issues that they're facing at the moment. I would highly recommend jump on the uh, Fanatec subreddit forum and uh, do some reading there, some research for yourself so you understand exactly what you're getting into. But look, the reality of it is, is I think that there is a lot of potential here. I've, I think that there's a lot of really cool things that they've done here, particularly with the integration of the dash and having the ability to make all those adjustments, including audio adjustments right here from the wheel, particularly in the context of people wanting to use this on, a, uh, on an Xbox console. I think that that might end up being a really powerful feature for people, maybe not quite so useful on PC. But look, my honest opinion, and this is just my opinion, hopefully I've shown you enough objective information in this video that you can make your own judgment here. But look, my honest opinion is if I was spending my own money, I would choose one of those ready to race bundles from Fanatec and then maybe look at upgrading the brake pedal over buying this. Or I would save up a little bit more and get something like a uh, Simmagic Alpha Mini or uh, even, even the Logitech G Pro, although it is a lot more expensive than what we have here, does give you a superior driving experience. It also does have true force as well, which adds another layer on top in terms of the fidelity, in terms of the force feedback. So that is something that's worth considering as well. I don't want to try and steer you towards buying a more expensive product. I don't think you necessarily need to spend more than this to get a good sim racing experience. And that's why I kind of come back to those ready to race bundles, because I do think that they provide better value for money overall as a complete package than what we're getting out of the Turtle Beach at this point in time, but maybe that will change over time. I do feel like the shortcomings for the most part, other than this horrendously bad button box, are mostly related to software and implementation. That's kind of what I would expect from a brand new brand entering the uh, sim racing space for the first time. So no real surprises there. There are a few disappointments. There are a few things that I think they've done really well. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what they can come out with in the future. But a new brand into the space is always a good thing. It adds more competition and that can only be good for sim racers like us. So if you found the video helpful, please do leave a thumbs up. Make sure you subscribe to the channel as well so you don't miss out on future videos like this one. We do have those affiliate links available down in the description box below as well if you want to pick up any of the gear that we've talked about in today's video. Again, that is an awesome way of helping support our work here at no additional cost to you and we really do appreciate your support there. But above all, thank you very much for watching guys and uh, yeah, let us know what you think in the comments about the Turtle Beach Velocity 1 race. Let us know if you own one as well, what your experience has been like so far and if you do buy one of these, please do set a reminder to come back after 6 to 12 months and let us know in the comments on this video what your experience has been like. There are a lot of unknowns and it's always great to get that feedback from you guys. I think that that's actually more valuable than the review video itself. So thanks for doing that and I will see you again very soon. Bye.